now let's talk about the real stuff. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about how to have a healthy soul in an anxious world. And um, let me uh, violate some HIPAA laws and pull the room. If you have, since you started at Florida State, had and are willing to admit publicly, an episode with a mental health challenge since you started at Florida State, you had a season of anxiety or depression or sadness or some challenges really managing your stress. Let me see your hand. Okay. Me too. And I want to start by talking to you about a depressive episode that I had my freshman year. Um, I grew up in a Christian home and uh, knew all the Jesus stuff. I wasn't against any of it, but I got into high school and I decided I wanted to be cool. And following Jesus and being cool just, just they just didn't go together, man. And so uh, I did the high school sneak around your parents' back thing to, you know, enjoy myself a little bit. And then I drove all the way up here. I, I grew up in Fort Pierce. And so I was way far away from my parents and my church. And I did whatever the heck I wanted to. And at first, it was kind of exhilarating. But in my second semester, um, it just started to sink. And I fell into this depression. I didn't even know that that's what I really would have called it. Um, so in the middle of that depression, it was in March of 1989, I got a phone call from my cousin. Cousin Sandy, she's one year older than me. She was uh, part of the Christian ministry at UCF in Orlando. And her little singing group was on their way to Alabama to do a spring break missions trip. And they stopped here to do a concert. She knew that I went here. I had certainly never set foot in this building before. She called me and said that she was going to be here. Well, that side of the family was really tight, so I came. And I sat in the concert here, and the Orlando group, the Tallahassee group, went out and had a little uh, party social time together after. And the joy and the connection that I felt in this room with these people started waking me up. And um, I'll try to shorten the story, but basically I had an opportunity to get involved in a ministry, uh, uh, a mission opportunity for the summer. And I really felt like it was something that I should do, but then I had this epiphany. It's like, well, if I'm going to be like a Christian missionary, I'm going to have to mean this stuff. I'm going to have to like, I can't like, have one foot in and one foot out. I can't be pleasing myself up here and then showing up with the plastic Jesus face. It's like, it's gonna have to be real. And so, I kinda came to a moment one afternoon in my room on the third floor of Landis, and I realized that to really follow Jesus, what I was gonna do is I was gonna have to take the keys out and hand them to Jesus and put him in the driver's seat of my life. And that moment of surrender was when I was born again. And the thing that happened to me on the inside was my depression lifted immediately. And like I think I floated around this campus for the next three weeks. But it was the beginning of a lifelong journey with Jesus. Um, and it's taken me to live for many years in cities that I've never heard of and do ministry with people that I never had any vision of doing. And I'm in a place in South Florida where I can't even believe I get to do what I get to do. And I had Barry take me over and get me into Landis today because I just wanted to stand there. Because letting Jesus in is still the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I don't know where all of you guys are. Some of you may be here, like not even not even knowing about Christianity, oh man, there is nothing better than Jesus. And I'm 34 years later here to tell you that I have absolutely no regret to laying it all on the table for him. And uh, I couldn't be happier to be here. Officially, I'm on a recruiting trip, but really, I'm on a spiritual pilgrimage of sorts because this building and the people that I met here have been so incredibly intrinsic to my life and to my happiness in the Lord. 
So uh, that's a little bit of my about a, a bit of my history. Now, um, one thing I remember about my freshman year is you show up as a freshman and you've never kind of been on your own, right? And you look around at the other freshmen and you quickly learn that their level of preparation to handle life is, well, it's kind of mixed, right? You have some people who have good raising, they're very put together, they know how to organize their room, they know how to do their laundry, they know how to keep a calendar. And then you have the guys on the third floor at Landis Hall who, uh, you know, the gym bro types who, uh, who find the laundry and they're just stuffing as much and it's like, it's like bro, the, like the, your, your clothes aren't even gonna move, right? And uh, back, back in those days, we didn't have like color fast clothing. And so they would put like one red sock in with their whites and they would be wearing pink uh, for the rest of the time. That doesn't happen anymore. Like you guys are spoiled by the technology. But, uh, but you can tell that sometimes freshmen just don't know how to manage themselves, right? They don't know how to take care of themselves. One of the markers of adulthood is that you learn how to take care of yourself. The same is true spiritually, because when you come to faith in Jesus, you don't know anything. And Jesus just loves you, he forgives your sin, he takes you by the hand, he starts with mercy, but his plan is to move you to maturity. Okay? And taking care of yourself spiritually is about being spiritually strong. It's about knowing some truth that will set you free. It's about submitting to spiritual disciplines that are going to translate to strength and connection with God and other people. And the term that I want to use for that tonight is soul care. Soul care, by which I mean your caring for your own soul, is a discipline. It's really a group of disciplines. It's a posture of responsibility that you take toward yourself and toward God. Uh, uh, here's, my, here's my definition of it. Soul care is the discipline of maintaining, maintaining your soul physical, mental, and spiritual health so that you can follow and serve the Lord from a place of strength and well-being. Um, if you pay attention at all, you've probably heard of some soul care failures among Christian leaders. Or maybe you've been around church and you've seen some soul care failures among Christians. There's an old uh, Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McShane. He died at 29 years old after working himself to death. And here was his quote from his deathbed. He said, God gave me a horse to ride and a message to deliver. Alas, I have killed the horse and I cannot deliver the message. He never rested and he worked himself to death. When I was in my 20s, I began to see some people that I had gotten to know in ministry. Some of them were in their 40s and 50s. They started to flame out in their faith. And to a large degree, those were failures in soul care. Now, you've probably heard the term self-care, which is really popular in our culture. And people mean different things by it. And a lot of times, it's a focus on physical replenishment and rest and vacation. And a lot of times, it's used in contexts where people um, kind of underplay the role of God in your life. Um, and so the reason I'm using the term soul care is to kind of differentiate from sort of a secular sense of self-care, even though there's some overlap uh, with the practices. So tonight I have four, uh, four truths about soul care that I want to I share with you. The first one is soul care is your responsibility, no one else's. Okay. Again, you think about how God's trying to grow you in maturity. Okay. When you're two years old, it's okay that you can't dress yourself. When you're 10, it's pathetic. Okay? You've got to develop the discipline of caring for yourself. Soul care is not your mom's job. It's not your pastor's job. It's not your friend's job. It's not even your accountability partner's job. It is your job. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, gathers them on the beach. He's given them their farewell speech. His last thing to them, he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock that God's made you overseers. Be on guard for yourselves. He did the same thing with Timothy. He said to Timothy, pay close attention to your life. You have to pay attention to your life. No one else will do it for you. 
Now, the great thing is we don't care for our souls on our own. Jesus cares for us. We can cast our cares on him. But at the, at the end of the day, we have responsibility. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Okay? Well, who's doing the coming to Jesus? It's got to be you. You've got to get up and come to him in order to receive the care for your soul. Okay. Another thing I want to say is that it's not selfish to care for yourself. Sometimes you're like, no, I can't do that. It's selfish. No, it's obedience is what it is. You have a responsibility from God to care for yourself. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he's assuming the priority of soul care in the life of everyone who follows him. And you don't have to earn the right to care for yourself. God has given you the right and responsibility to care for yourself. Number one, soul care is my responsibility. No, no one else's. Number two, wise soul care follows a sequence. Wise soul care follows a sequence. Now, to illustrate what I mean, I want to go to the story where God cared for Elijah when he was fleeing from Jezebel. This is in 1 Kings chapter 19. A Bible or a digital equivalent, you want to go there and follow along with the gospel. Okay. Um, now, you may not be familiar with this story. So, Elijah's prophet, and uh, there are all of these worshipers of Baal and Ashtoreth all throughout the all throughout the land, and he challenges them all to a showdown, and he calls them all to the top of Mount Mount Carmel, and they build two altars. Do you know the story? Raise your hand if you know the story. Some of you don't. Okay, so they build two altars, and uh, Elijah's like the only prophet of the Lord, and there's 450 prophets of Baal. And he's like, all right, you guys go first. Build your altar. Don't light it. Call on your God. The God who answers by fire is God. It's the showdown of the gods. And so the followers of Baal call out all day long. They cut themselves. Nothing happens. Okay. End of the day, Elijah says, all right, let's dig a trench and douse the Lord's altar with water. So he's got the sacrifice there. He's got the wood. Douse it with water. Steps back, prays. God drops the fire from heaven. Proves that he's God. All the people gather up all of the false prophets. Drag them down to the valley and slaughter all of them. Old Testament, baby. <laughs> so it's a... Uh, it's this massive victory for the truth of the worship of Yahweh in the midst of this pagan environment. Okay. Well, then Jezebel finds it. But she's the queen, and she really likes all of her prophets of Baal and everything. So she sends a message to Elijah. Here's the story. Uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 1. Ahab, who's the king, told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Verse 3. Then Elijah, the conquering hero of Mount Carmel, became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba, that was a long way, that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey in the wilderness. He sat on the broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough. Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Bro's exhausted and he's depressed and he's depleted. Now, pay attention to what God does. Verse, end of verse 9. Suddenly, an angel touched him, and the angel told him, Get up and eat. Then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down with him. Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up, ate, and drank. Then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And he entered a cave and spent the night there. All right, so God cares for Elijah based on the way God made him as a human being. Here's how I want to show you this. First thing God does, food, water, and sleep. Okay? Why does God start there? Because Elijah is a physical person. And if you are physically unwell, it affects everything about you. Okay? If your physical health is out of whack, if you would just get that together, it would lift 
everything else about your life. Okay? Next thing, the angel comes and speaks encouragement to you. It's like, Elijah, get up and eat. Okay? The angel's encouraging Elijah to take the steps to care for himself, right? Now, the angel provides the foods right there, but the angel can't eat for him and won't, right? There was no IV injection, right? God doesn't do all that for you. There's some things that God wants to do for you that you have to cooperate with. This is how it works in soul care. Okay? So guys, you have food and gyms and beds and water bottles. They are provided for you. But you have to eat and exercise and sleep and drink. You have to do it. Next thing God gives it. Exercise, solitude, and space to think. He walked. 40 days and 40 nights down before it, all the way down in like the Arabian Peninsula down there, uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, same, same mountain, two names, okay? 40 day walk to Horeb gave him this emotional space. Walks in nature, time to think, all of that is healing and restorative, okay? Then, and I didn't read all of this, Okay. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So God speaks to him. You're like, okay, here we're going to get the word from, word from the Lord. Here's what the Lord says. What are you doing here, Elijah? God starts with a question. Okay. God doesn't give him commands. God listens to him. God lets him express his emotions and pour himself out. And here's what he says. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. But the Israelites said, the band here come and torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. God just lets him vent. Then God shows up, shows himself to Elijah, like there's a fire, and there's an earthquake, and there's all this dramatic stuff. And then finally God appears in this slow, gentle whisper. And then God listens to him again, asking the same question. And Elijah says the same thing. And God does not crab at Elijah for saying the same thing. Because Elijah is still frustrated and emotional. And then the last thing God does, in verse 15, he gives Elijah instructions for the next step. Go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. And then there's all these guys that Elijah was supposed to anoint for leadership over Israel. Okay? Why soul care follows a sequence. Now, in church, we think many times that prayer and Bible study are the answer to everything. You're depressed? Well, you should pray more. Are you reading your Bible? I'm anxious. I'm having anxiety attacks. Well, have you prayed and read your Bible? Okay. All right. So uh, I'm not anti-prayer and Bible study. Okay. But what I'm arguing is that the proper sequence of soul care starts with your body and then moves to your emotions. And then spiritual disciplines come last. Now, if that seems wrong to you, please notice that that is what God did with Elijah when he was dealing with his depression and his challenges. there. God had a set of instructions for Elijah, but all of that waited until he addressed the other things first. Now, why does soul care follow the sequence? That doesn't mean you spend six months in the gym before you start praying. That's not what I mean, okay? But what I mean is that trying to do spiritual disciplines on top of unhealthy body and unhealthy emotions that you're not addressing appropriately is like teaching a toddler colors and shapes when they have a dirty diaper. Okay? It's just a first things first kind of thing. All right, number three. Why soul care is holistic. Why soul care addresses all aspects of being human. Now, I started gesturing in this direction but I want to do a little theological anthropology with you, okay? What does it mean to be a human being? Because if you're going to care for yourself as a human, you have to know what, it, what kind of a thing you are. According to the Bible, we're made in the image of God, male and female, embodied beings with physical bodies, and we have immaterial souls. <laughs> Part of our challenge is that we live in a culture who has other ideas about what it means to be a human being. There are two primarily, like this is an oversimplification, but there are two main competitors to the biblical view of what it means to be human. 
The first one is that we're basically material beings, right? That our bodies are fundamental, and that consciousness and emotions and motivations and all that kind of stuff that makes up our mental soul are emergent qualities that are kind of based on the brain or the physical understructure. And so your minds are incidental rather than fundamental to who you are. Now that's one option. The other option, which is more popular, is what I call the new Gnosticism. We engage digitally so often now in disembodied thoughts, images, texts, that this kind of interaction engages our mind and our will and our emotion in a disembodied framework. And what can lead us to think is that our bodies are either unimportant or transcendable. Okay? You remember the movie Avatar? Okay. What year was that? That's been a while, right? Okay. So in Avatar, you have a paralyzed guy, right? His body's not functioning, so they put him in this thing, and his mind, will, and emotion is able to drive this other body in this other world, and he lives out this whole crazy life through a physical avatar that's not really his body, but he's kind of driving it. Okay? Right. Um, originally, Gnosticism was a Greek approach to what it means to be human, and basically it played up the value of the immaterial soul and played down the body. And um, you see the early church fathers kind of arguing against this. Uh, because on one hand, people would say, oh, my soul's the only important thing, and so they would go and do like immoral things with their bodies and say, yeah, but it's the body, it doesn't matter. Or, on the other hand, they would like do all these ascetic practices and like beat themselves and whatever, and it was like almost this hatred of material things because it was an elevated, elevated the immaterial soul. And we're kind of led into this, because like layer one is like, if you're texting with someone, you're, compu you're communicating in a disembodied way. You're like, okay, well like, people used to write notes to each other way back in the day, so what's so bad about that? All right, so layer two, if you have like a Zoom or a Teams meeting, okay, your face is there, but your body's not, but then you have this thing where you can like change the background, where like you're in your basement, but it looks like you're on the bridge of a Star Destroyer, or you're on this beautiful sunset, or people are like, oh, where are you on vacation, right? And so it's sort of you, and it's sort of not you. So that's layer two. So layer three is you uh, jump in a video game with your buddies, but you're entirely interacting in that world through an avatar. And in the in your character, like you can change everything. You can change clothes, you can change hair, you can change body type, you can change equipment at will. Okay? Metaverse, virtual reality takes that even a step further. And then finally, the fourth layer, and this is sort of its most obvious instantiation in our culture, is transgender ideology, which says that the inner sense of identity is so much more important than anything the body has to say, is the body is incidental to your fundamental identity as a human being. And so you could say, uh, believe that you're a woman even though you are anat anatomically and genetically and biologically a man, right? And so you see, you see the separation. That's the second main Right? One, one view says that you're just a body, and the other one says you're just a mind or just a soul. Okay? Both of those views are false and inadequate. Okay? And the Bible's view pulls those things together. Okay? This, by the way, is why you should always look for a Christian mental health counselor if you're having mental health challenges. Because if your therapist thinks you're just a body, they will sit and they will listen carefully to you and then they will give you medicine. That's their only play, because it's the only thing they can do. Or, on the other hand, if your therapist thinks that you're just a mind, they're just gonna listen to what you say, and they're just gonna affirm whatever it is. That's the play, if that's your view of what a human being is. But if you are taking your anxiety and depression to a Christian mental health therapist, well, the Christian mental health therapist operating off of a biblical anthropology would say, well, maybe the reason you're depressed is something chemical is out of whack in your body, and so maybe, uh, maybe you need medicine, or maybe you need sleep, right? Or 
Maybe there's something relational going on. Maybe you have strife and unforgiveness in an important relationship because you're a relational being, according to the Bible. And maybe you need coaching in how to solve that. Or maybe it's an emotional thing and you need help processing these emotions. Maybe you've had some trauma and that's why these things are embedded in you and you need help doing that. Or maybe there's a moral problem with your depression, like me, my first year of, uh, of uh, life at Florida State, living however I wanted to live. The reason I was depressed is I had a sin problem and I needed to repent. Or maybe there's a demonic evil force that's oppressing you and you need prayer and you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Or, it could be some combination of all of those things. Because friends, we are complex, and we need an approach to understanding ourselves that acknowledges the fullness of human complexity, okay? So, um, I, I just wanna kinda take these one at a time and talk through some practical things. Um, oh gosh, I gotta speed up. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Sorry, I didn't you know. I just didn't see that. Okay, let's do the script thing. All right. So if you're physical, what happens in your body affects everything in your soul. Like, for instance, if you're sleep deprived, are you more or less vulnerable to temptation? You're more vulnerable to temptation. If you're dehydrated, you will feel worse. If you're in pain, can you do your best work? No. You're physical. You have to take care of your physical self. I discovered way too late how important exercise is. Right? If you will exercise, it affects your mental health. Like most guys in the in the gym lifting weights just don't want to go to therapy. Right? <laughs> it's true. It's true. And if you will do it, you will feel better. <laughs> I'm lying. I'm dying. or a star athlete, just go on a walk, okay? Sleep, I'm huge on this, guys. Some of you are probably underperforming in every area of the life because you don't go to bed, okay? If you are not getting seven to nine hours of sleep, no wonder you feel terrible, okay? Have you ever slept so long and so deeply that when you woke up, it was like, I feel amazing. <laughs> Remember those times? Remember those times? Yeah. Listen, I am here to tell you that you ought to feel like that every morning. Psalm 127.2, in vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for the bread of painful labors, for he gives sleep to those he loves. Memorize that. Write it on your mirror. Go to bed. Okay. Right? If you're tired, are you more or less vulnerable to temptation? You're more vulnerable to temptation. Go to bed. Um, rest, by the way, is not the same as vegging. Okay? A lot of times we do things because we feel we need rest, but what we're doing is actually distraction and not recreation. Recreation is recreation. It's a renewing kind of thing, right? Um, uh, binging Netflix is not rest. Doom scrolling Instagram and TikTok is not rest. It is not rest. <laughs> Uh, drink your water. Most Americans are dehydrated, and it, and and so many times you think you're hungry and you're thirsty, and uh, it affects everything. Okay, here's the other thing. And I, gosh, I'm I'm so late already. But sitting at the intersection of our physical and our volitional and our emotional life is sex, and part of the reason. Christianity has all of these rules and regulations about sex is because it's so central to who we are because it affects so many parts of who we are and that's why pornography is so destructive 
and illicit sexual relationships are so destructive, and it's important to be healthy and holy in your sexuality. Um, because if you're not, it will affect everything. Uh, your relationships with food is in a kind of similar place because it's in that intersection of your body needs it and you kind of want it, but you can't get away from the need for it. And so sometimes we get these out of kilter relationships with food where we're using it for comfort or we're like going back and forth with it. Okay. And that's just physical. All right. Uh, I have so much more. All right. Let me, uh, let me speed through these last things. Uh, this is, okay. I apologize. It's just, uh, let's talk about emotions. You're an emotional person. And emotions are powerful because they drive us, they motivate us to action. We are, we come out of the womb feeling emotions years before we can put thoughts together. And that's why it's important for us to be emotionally self-aware. Um, at the end of this, I'm going to give you a QR code to a soul care checkup. It's a little inventory that I want you to have the freedom to kind of take. And one of the questions on that inventory is the question, what is your resting emotion? A resting emotion is like a resting heart rate. If you sit in a room and you let everything sort of settle down, how are you feeling underneath everything else? Are you content? Are you anxious? Are you sad? It's important to know that because that emotion is going to drive you whether you're aware of it or not. Um, the other key thing about emotions is Emotions attach themselves to thoughts, and thoughts can be true or false. And sometimes we stay stuck in emotions we shouldn't be feeling because we're believing things that are false. I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, I began telling myself a story in my head that my church was going to fire me because they didn't need me anymore. It wasn't true. But I worked myself up into this ball of anxiety. And I've never had, I've always been, I've always had a proneness to depression, but never to anxiety. And it took me a few months to like unwind, oh, the story that I'm telling myself is not true. And a lot of times we stay stuck in emotional states that we shouldn't be in because we're telling ourselves, we're believing lies. Paul talks about deceitful desires. Because your emotions will lie to you and tell you things that aren't true. That's why you have to pay attention to them. Okay? We are intellectual people, um, and it's important for you to be a lifelong learner. Intellectual pursuits that are interesting to you is part of how you care for your soul. Sorry, that's all I have time for on that. Uh, next, we are relational. You need the kind of friends who love you and do not drain you. Sometimes you have to fire some of your friends. I did this in seminary. I had a buddy, really liked him, we had a lot in common. But every time I went to hang out with him, he was so competitive, he had to turn everything into he wins and I lose. And every time I left spending time with him, I felt worse about myself. So I fired him. <laughs> Here's another thing about relationships. One of the things we are as humans is we're permeable. Remember that from chemistry? Like permeable membranes are things that things can pass through, okay? As a human being, you're permeable. You are affected by the environments, by the relationships, and by the moods, and by the people that you surround yourself with. This is why the little adage that you are the sum of the five people you spend most time with is true. And so you have to be careful about how you do that. And that doesn't mean you become a snob and say, oh, no, I can't spend time for you. You're not good enough for me. Okay? But it's something that you have to manage. Media consumption affects us because we're permeable. Okay? All right. Finally, we're spiritual. Guys, I'm skipping so much. I'm sorry. I just can't do this fast. Okay? When I was president of the BCM, the director gave me the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And I read it, and by God's mercy, he has allowed me to consistently practice some spiritual disciplines that have been anchor points in my life. Okay. 
If you are following Jesus, you should be in the Bible every day. That's what it means. You should be in the Bible every day. It's really not optional. These are the kind of, again, we're talking about caring for your own soul. If you're going to be happy and healthy and prosperous and flourish in the way God wants you to, you're going to have to be building truth into your life all the time. And I've been reading the Bible pretty much every day for 34 years. And I'm telling you, I have to have it. And so do you. Bible engagement is the number one predictor of spiritual growth. And number two is not even close. Okay. Um, let's say about a, a word about prayer. I've never met anyone who's proud of their prayer life. And so if people ask you about your prayer life and you feel ashamed, okay, join the crowd. Me too. Ignore all of that and just pray. Pray with people that you haven't prayed. Pray more than you've prayed before. And just lean into talking with God. Um, another Bible challenge I will give to you. Pick a book in the Bible to become the master of. Right? Each one of you could become the BCM expert in whatever you want. It could be as hefty as Genesis or as short as Philemon. When I was president of BCM, I got um, I was asked to teach a class on 2 Timothy. And I became the expert on 2 Timothy. And I'm telling you, what I built into my soul out of the book of 2 Timothy. 34 years ago is still with me. Okay. I still refer to those things almost every week. Things that I learned out of, out of that. Okay. Oh, and I need to tell you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I did this. Uh, I did this on our young adult retreat, and there's. I had one of my students was there running the retreat, and. I went way too long, and I went down and I said to him, please don't ever do what I just did, and here I am doing it. Okay. Here's the other thing, spiritually. Please remember that your number one problem is your sin. It's your number one problem. Okay. Your depression's not your problem. Your laziness is a, well, your laziness is a, right? There's a lot of things you can think is a problem, right? But your sin is your number one problem, and that's why the hardest discipline is confession. But it's also the most freeing one, okay? Talking about your own sins with another human being is brutal. Like, I hate it. But nothing sets me free faster than doing it, okay? So find people that you can trust, that you can talk about your sin, because it's going to give you freedom from the guilt and shame that you carry because of it. And you need to press in with them. You need to know the truth and let the truth set you free. And that happens best in the context of community. All right. My fourth and final point, I'll make this quick. Why soul care prepares us to be like Jesus. Listen, if you're a Christian, the Father intends to make you like Jesus. This is Romans 8, 29. Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of your son. God's wonderful plan for your life is to make you like Jesus. You look at the life of Jesus, and you will see him caring for his own soul. You will see him leaving in the early, dark morning and getting away from people to be with God because he's the most important. You will see him pulling his disciples apart for rest because they need it. Jesus also came, John 10.10, 10, so that you could have abundant life. And if you don't care for your soul, you're not going to have an abundant life. Okay? The vision of a Christian life is not to serve, serve, serve with no breaks and wear yourself out. Right? You have to care for yourself. You have to keep yourself healthy. But on the other hand, the purpose of the Christian life is not your comfort and entertainment either. Okay? The Christian life is not a cruise. And sometimes secular approaches to self-care can have this comfort obsession and self-focus. And uh, Jesus did not come to make you comfortable. Right? 
You did not come so you could have nice Christian friends, a tidy life, and heaven at the end. That's not his plan. We have a serious calling and commission to make disciples and live as ambassadors for Christ. And it's a love, it's a life of love and self-sacrifice. It's not always pleasant. But soul care helps us be ready to do all of that well from a place of happiness and rest in the Lord. Um, let's put up the QR code for the uh, soul care, uh, soul care checkup. Um, this is a PDF. I'd encourage you to grab this and download it and take a few minutes. Uh, in other contexts where I have more time, I make everybody do this live in front of me before I go through all of this so you can think about your own self as you do it. Um, but I really encourage you to, to take time to work through this and answer those things and then get with a couple people and talk about what you learned about yourself. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, at the end of it, there's a couple of instructions that tell you, man, just share a uh, share one thing that's going really well and one area that you need to grow in, in your personal soul care. Um, all right, last thing, and then I just want to pray for you. Um, last thing I want you to remember is that Jesus really loves you. If you're not following him yet, I really, I really want you to consider it deeply, and I wish you would do it. And if you're on the fence about it, if you have questions about it, I would, I'm going to hang out afterward. I'd love to talk to you. Those of you who are following Jesus, all of these things, these burdens that God is putting on you, he's putting on you because he loves you and he wants you to flourish. Okay? And your flourishing as a mature Christian is on the other side of you picking up some adult responsibilities to take of yourself. And I hope that you've picked up one or two things about how you can do that a little bit.